All right, let's now finally talk about training single layer neural networks and in particular the perceptron learning rule. So that goes back to the Rosenblatt perceptron that we briefly mentioned in the history of deep learning lecture. So the perceptron is kind of like a model, but um, yeah, thinking about it, the model was already proposed by McCulloch's and Pitts, the mathematical model of a neuron in the human brain. So at least it was inspired by this biological neuron. And the perceptron, to be more, I would say, specific, it's a learning rule for the computational mathematical representation of the neural model. So this is now offering us something that can help us find the weights automatically to make classifications, for example. So previously, we have seen that uh, how we can manually implement AND and OR um, functions using yeah, specific weights of 1 and a certain threshold. Now with the perceptron, we can find automatic weights for different types of problems, like uh, classification problems in general. So here's a picture of how that looked like back then. So back then, the perceptron was actually a hardware device where people, or Frank Rosenblatt, had to plug in and plug out certain cables to uh, reach certain decisions and stuff like that. So, but yeah, we are not in a museum here, so we don't have to go over how that works. Um, so yeah, moving on. Um, so I also should highlight just for correctness, there are multiple perceptron algorithms. And um, I, I don't know how many, but there are several variants. Here we are talking about, let's call it the perceptron. So a basic version of the perceptron, which is now the commonly yeah, known variant. So when we talk about the perceptron, in theory, it's a perceptron, one of the classic Rosenblatt perceptrons. But yeah, um, there are multiple ones. We don't have to worry about it here. We just take um, the classic one that is commonly known and just refer to it as perceptron for short. So yeah, now we have a computational model of a biological neuron here. So for reference, yeah, on the left-hand side, what is shown is the biological neuron. And on the right-hand side would be the computational or mathematical representation of that. So the one based on McCulloch and Pitt's idea. And that is also then the model that we are going to use in the perceptron. So the perceptron learning rule would be then learning the parameters of this model. So how does this model work? So what we have here are the inputs, x1 to xm. And you can think of it as um, yeah, uh, a feature vector. For example, if you think back of the iris data set, so in the iris data set, we had a tabular data set where we had petal length, um, oh, let's do it correctly, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, the four features. And then uh, we had uh, the number of training examples, so one, two, three, four, and so forth. And in this case, we had m features where m equals four. So uh, here as x1, x2, xm, you can really think of it as a feature vector, for example, a feature vector corresponding to the first training example. And then each feature value gets multiplied by a weight. So you can see each x here goes together with a weight. So they are multiplied to compute the so-called net input, the weighted sum. So this is a weighted sum, which you compute wi times xi and um, this is then our what we usually use or we usually use the letter z for representing that to have it more compactly um, and then so this is the net input here and then we pass it to a threshold function and a threshold function is returning a class label so the class label is either zero or one depending on the value of z so if z is smaller than the threshold then we, we return the class label zero. And if Z is greater than a threshold, we return class label one. Or to be more precise, if Z is smaller or equal to the threshold, but if we use floating point operations like uh, real value numbers in a computer, then the chance that something is equal is very small because it could be also equally um, greater or equal to so in that case we could remove it here so it's what i'm trying to say is whether we use zero uh, um, smaller than and greater equal to or smaller equal to and greater doesn't really matter either either way would work because the chance that we have an equal is kind of yeah um very small anyways so yeah in our output this is the either the zero or the one that is our class label and now we can um yeah, then talk about a learning rule for this perceptron that can then be used to determine a good threshold and a good um, 
or good values for w so that we can solve different classification problems, for example, classifying flowers in an iris data set. However, one shortcoming here is that this is only for binary labels, so 0 and 1, and in iris we have three flower classes. So if we would want to use the standard perceptron for iris, we would have to simplify the data set to only two flower classes. But we are getting ahead of ourselves here. So also here at the bottom I just see another equation I included, so um, this is also yeah, abbreviating the threshold. So the threshold based on um, the threshold function based on the threshold theta. If it receives basically the in, uh, weighted input, so this is the net input, it returns the predicted class label y hat. So y hat, the output is the predicted class label. I will show you how that looks like for a concrete data set later on. Yeah, here to recap some of the terminology that I already introduced in the previous slide, I made an overview slide because some of these um, symbols and words or terms uh, will be used later on in this course when we talk also about logistic regression and multilayer uh, neural nets. So we have the net input, which is just another word for the weighted inputs, and we usually use the symbol or letter Z for denoting that. And the activations, um, these are values uh, from an activation function. So an activation function takes the net input as input and we use the letter A and the activation function is a sigma which takes in Z. So this is something um, yeah, that we will be using over and over in this course. And then the output um, of a model, that is when we apply the threshold to these activations of the last layer of a neural network. And um, we can, for example, use y hat to denote the predicted label or the output, and um, f as the threshold function, which takes in a. So the flow would be, you can think of it as um, uh, first computing. So if we go from z, so we have z is the weighted net input. So this is computed based on x and w, and then we use um, sigma, an activation function, to compute these activations. And then we have f to uh, compute the label outputs. So this will become also more clear later because right now we have a special case in the perceptron where our activation function is the same as a threshold function. So the perceptron doesn't really have an activation function. They are here in that case synonymous. And in linear regression, um, there's another special case. So some of you are probably already familiar with linear regression. So in linear regression, the activation is equal to the net input and it's also equal to the output. So in that way, um, yeah, uh, these are two special cases and it will become more clear. So uh, I can maybe quickly draw this. So if we have a linear regression model, recall um, what we had in the history of deep learning lecture and also on the Piazza discussion, the relationship or the figure that I shown of the Adeline and then also how that related to the linear regression. So if we have then the model here in a linear regression, we would have a linear activation or just the the weighted um, sum and then the output is just the weighted sum, it's our continuous value. In a regular neuron we have usually the steps, uh, we have the weighted sum, so this is our net input and then we have uh, activation function and then we have a threshold function and then this produces our output. However, in the perceptron, so in the perceptron these are the same, the sigma and the threshold function, they are one function. And in the um, linear regression model, so in the linear regression model we don't have these, so the net input is basically our y hat. So there are these special cases. But let's uh, not worry about it too much because we will be talking about linear regression and logistic regression uh, later on in more detail. So you will see how these concepts of activation functions and thresholds relate to these. So let's focus in now on the perceptron and only worry about the net input and the threshold where in the bottom here you can 
again see the summary where we have first the weighted inputs as the net input and then we apply the threshold to return either the 0 or 1 depending on the threshold um, yeah, value um, theta. So um, I want to make one little change to that formula to make things a little bit more convenient. So I just told you that um, we return 0 if z is smaller or equal to theta, the threshold, and it's, uh, the output is 1 if z is greater than theta. It's a little bit inconvenient to write it like this. Um, for yeah, I mean, it's not that inconvenient, but for the sake of training the perceptron, it would be more inconvenient. So we will make things a little bit more convenient by rearranging the terms. So we are just now applying the mathematical operation minus theta on both sides. So we are bringing theta here onto the left side. And then what we get is um, <clears throat> we return 0 if z is smaller, uh, if z minus theta is smaller or equal to 0. And we return 1 if z minus theta is greater than 0. So in this way, this is our, I would say, more convenient notation here. And if you think about it like that, you can think of um, the negative threshold. So this part here, you can think of it as a as a bias. So um, in the, this is like a common term in deep learning or also in machine learning, a bias unit. It's a little bit weird to use the term bias because it's a little bit overloaded. There are other types of bias. For example, there's an inductive bias, um, like this relational inductive bias that we talked about. There's also a fairness bias. And now we have this um, bias, a mathematical bias unit here. Um, there's also yeah, a statistical bias, if you think of decomposing a loss function into a bias and a variance term. So it's a bit unfortunate, but yeah, in the context of deep learning, if you read the term bias unit, that would be, in this case, this, um, this theta. We can treat it as a parameter. It will become more clear um, in a few moments. Yeah, so in this representation, we are now using the bias as a parameter when we compute z. So we set um, the minus theta to b. b is short for bias unit. So it's easy to memorize b for bias unit. So we set b equals to this minus theta. And then we compute the z, the net input, as shown here. So just to recap, what we had before was multiplying the w's and the x's. So um, this is from index 1 to m. And this was our z. Now, when we compute the z, let's call that, let's make that red to denote this is our new z. This includes now our bias unit. So our net input is now including the bias unit. If we want to update the figure to reflect that, I've drawn here this b. This b goes now also into the net input. So the net input is really this computation here. And um, yeah, it's also the same as shown here. And now what we can do is we can also write then um, the activation function or here the um, threshold function. So I should have actually used f, but the perceptron is the special case where the threshold function is equal to the activation function. So I can use either sigma or f, doesn't matter here, uh, to be consistent. And um, so now we can have the zero here on the right hand side instead of having the minus theta. So this will make more sense from a learning perspective. So in this way, it's easier to parameterize the network if we don't have to learn the threshold here on the right hand side. It's just easier to write in code because then we have a threshold function that just simply checks whether some th something is greater or smaller than zero. But of course, you can also implement it um, like shown on the previous slide with a minus theta. It doesn't really matter. But this is also the common notation. And this will be something that you will also encounter when we talk about um, multilayer perceptrons, convolutional networks, recurrent neural networks, and when we use existing code implementations, for example, in PyTorch, this is really like the common way, also if you look at recent deep learning papers. So this is like, the, like I said, the common notation that you will find in most modern texts, like um, maybe not textbooks, because textbooks are usually a few years behind with the trends, but if you look at a modern deep learning literature, you will find that people use this extra, um, this notation with a additional bias unit here. 
Um, yeah, however, it's slightly inconvenient for mathematical notation compared to a slightly different notation again. So on the right, uh, on the next slide, I will show you how we can modify this even a little bit differently to have the bias as part of yeah, the inputs. So here, what I've done now is I'm setting b equals to uh, weight. I call that um, w0. And this is again our minus theta or minus our negative threshold. Um, now I'm including this bias as a weight. So first, let's maybe start with the figure. If you look at the figure here on the left-hand side, what I've now uh, what I've done now is I have removed this b here. I've removed that compared to the previous slide, and now have the value one. This is really like a value, an integer or float number of a value one. And then now I have the w zero as weight. So this is essentially our bias, but I'm writing it as a w because then we can write this notation more compactly. So instead of writing it on the previous slide with a index over one to m, like this with a w, with a b, or you can also write it as, as this. Instead of this, I can change this to a zero and then I can get rid of it it's slightly more compactly. It's not that interesting to do it like this, but there's one advantage of doing it is, is the advantage is that we can now use a dot product, just x um, transpose w. If we wouldn't have the modified version here, what we would have to do is we would have to write it as x transpose um, w plus b, which is just slightly more work. It's not that much more work. But yeah, mathematicians are sometimes efficient or lazy. No, I would say not lazy, definitely not lazy, but efficient. So the notation here shown would kind of help us to make things a little bit simpler. So why am I telling you this? So this is something, uh, this notation here on this slide is something you will find in some or most textbooks actually, whereas this is, I would say, the more modern one. I mean, for, for things like this, it might be overkill to use this separate bias, so this looks simpler. But when we talk about multi-layer networks, actually this becomes um, more convenient. And this is also what most framework use. And the reason why this is more convenient is because I'm um, going, I don't want to switch too much because it probably gets confusing when you watch this video and I'm going left and right and left and right. But one more thing about this slide is if you want to use this notation, you have to modify the inputs here, right? So if you think of the iris example, you have x1, x2, x3, x4 as your feature vector for one training example. So this would be your, let's say, uh, first training example. Now, if you have this as input and you want to use this notation, what you might have to do, what you would have to do is to have, you have to have uh, one here, so you have to modify this list. So in practice, usually you have a fixed size array and then you would have to make a new array. That's how, how it would work in a computer. You would have to make a new array that is a little bit bigger and then you have to move all the values. You have to, let me use different colors maybe. You have to make an x1, x2. Let's start with the one. Put the one here and then the x1, x2, x3, x4. So you have to make a new array to make the, uh, the one fit into this array. And making a new array can be expensive, of course. It's an additional computation. It's just much simpler if we just add this um, b to it. So if we compute it as x transpose w plus b, this is computation actually simpler than adding a new value to an array because then we have to make a copy of the array, move all the values over. And this is something, yeah, it's a computational consideration essentially. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what I wanted to show on this slide. I think I just wanted to emphasize again that we can now use a dot product. All right, so this is our general framework. Uh, and now we are going to take a look at the perceptron learning rule. So how it actually learns the weights to classify classes. So assume we have a binary classification task. So here we have two classes, these uh, blue dots and um, the yellow or no orange squares. And the perceptron finds the decision boundary to classify these two classes if the classes are separable. By that I mean if there is a linear decision boundary, I should have maybe said 
linearly separable. That means there has to exist a decision boundary that can separate these classes perfectly. Then the perceptron is guaranteed to find it. So here, just looking at it, you may guess a decision boundary could potentially look like that, and then it will uh, perfectly classify these two classes. So this is a um, problem with only two features for simplicity, because if I have more than two features, it would be very challenging to draw it in a slide. So in this case, we only focus on this simple example. And I actually made an animated GIF here. I will play it in a second. And then you can see how the network or the perceptron goes about the task of finding this decision boundary. So starting at a random place, it will basically yeah, um, update the rule in each iteration. So there will be an iteration counter moving up by, and it will, it will try to adjust decision boundaries to make them better, basically. So let's take a look. Actually, I forgot how many iterations there are. There might be 20 or 30. So you can see it's still making mistakes. And the circle um, that is shown here, that is um, indicating which data point it currently looks at. So you can see it's um, this black circle. It's moving around because uh, we have shuffled the data set. And then it will look at one training example at a time. And if it finds that um, there is a misclassification, then it will move the decision boundary. So if it, right now you can see it always finds classes that are already on the right correct side of the decision boundary. So there are no updates unnecessary. What it has to find are um, the ones where it makes mistakes like this here. If it touches these, oh, uh, no, it updated. So if it touches these, see, then um, it will update. So yeah, oh, it's back to one. So it was a little bit fast. Let me move on though. So yeah, what you can see here in the lower left corner is the result. So yeah, it was 49 iterations. So here is the final decision boundary, how it looks like. And you can see it, um, yeah, it classifies those two classes, say um, class zero and class one perfectly. Um, Note though, it's gar only guaranteed to converge if a solution exists. So if there is no solution to that, for example, if I have a blue dot that is here, there would be no decision boundary where you can classify this data set perfectly. And what will happen is, if the perceptron encounters this point, it will move the decision boundary more to, to this side. So it may even move the decision boundary, let's say, to here, but then all the other points are wrong, so it's moving it back here. But then again, this blue point is wrong and it's going back to the right-hand side, so it's always like flipping back and forth. So if the data set is not perfectly separable, then it will never stop to converge. Later in this course, we will of course learn about algorithms where this is not the case, where it will always converge to at least some solution that will at least stop updating. Because, I mean, this is a big issue. If you have a real-world data set, classes are rarely separable uh, by a linear decision boundary. There's usually always a case where you can't separate things perfectly. And it would be very annoying if your algorithm makes these big jumps back and forth. So um, the Adeline algorithm, for example, it will converge even if um, classes are not linearly separable. And we will yeah, learn about this in not too distant future. But for now, let's stick with the perceptron learning algorithm, just outlining how it learns. So there are three scenarios. It's uh, the one scenario is if, is if we make a correct prediction. By that, I mean if um, the predicted label y hat is equal to uh, the target label. So for that, we can also have two scenarios if the if y hat is one and y is one, or if the predicted label is zero. Oops, sorry. Someone that jumped here. The predicted label is zero and the actual label is also zero. Then we are correct and then we don't have to do anything. So if both the prediction and the output are equal to the target. I think this word is extra. Okay, and there are now two scenarios, A and B, where things have to be updated It's um, if we are incorrect. So one scenario is where y hat is zero and y is equal to one. So in this case, uh, what we do is we add the input vector to the weight vector. So we update it like that. So that means, uh, let me draw this maybe as an example. So if we have, let's say, data points here, data points here. Oh, let me 
spread them a little bit out, it's easier to draw the decision boundary. So let's say blue is class zero and yellow is class one. In this scenario here, what we have is we have the prediction as zero, although the true label is one. So for example, if we have a decision boundary like that, and we encounter this data point, what we have to do then is we have to move things over here. It's by adding the input vector to the weight vector. Uh, why is that? Um, I will show you exactly why that is uh, later when I go over the geometric intuition and it will become clear why we have to add the input vector to the weight vector rather than subtracting it. Um, the other scenario is if the output is 1 and the target is 0 and then we subtract the input vector from the weight vector. So there are two update rules here going on. They are both very similar. We can write this uh, mathematically very compactly as shown here. So here, uh, assume we have a data set D. This is our training data set. So we have n data points here from 1 to n. So x are our feature vectors and y are our class labels. Um, yeah, so this is our data set. And now here that's the perceptron learning algorithm. So how does it work? First we initialize the weights or the weight vector to zeros. If we have m weight vectors, that would be a vector of zeros. And we are assuming the notation where the uh, weight includes the bias, so we don't have to write the bias separately. We could do that, but it would be a little bit more work here. Um, so it would be a little bit more verbose. So it's a little bit more compact here. So then we have a for loop here. So for every training epoch, what is an epoch? Epoch means pass over the entire training set. So if I have a training set like shown here, then um, an epoch would be processing every data point in this data set. So for example, I consider the first data point, I do my computation, then I consider the second one, and so forth until I reach the last one. And then this is one epoch when I, when I reach this um, last data point and I have completed one epoch. And then I may go back to the beginning and do another sweep over the data set that would be then the second epoch and so forth. So epoch really means pass or iteration over the data set. So then this is our outer loop. So for every training epoch uh, is our outer loop and then the inner loop is for every data point in the data set. We perform steps A, B and C. So if we have multiple epochs, that means we can do this multiple times. So we would just go back to the beginning of the training set and do it all over again. So, but yeah, the interesting part happens now for every data point. So note here, the perceptron um, processes one data point or training, let's say, one training example at a time. So for every training example, compute the prediction. This is our prediction. And it's computed by computing the weighted sum. This is our net input. So this is uh, net input Z. And this is our predicted label. And then we compute the error. So the error is computed by the true label minus the predicted label. Why is that? So if this is one and this is y hat uh, is zero, for example, then, so let's first, let's assume the simple case where we make no error. So if we have zero and zero, then the error is zero. And then if you look at the uh, row C here, we have the weight update. So C is the weight update. Then the weight update or the new weight is the old weight plus the error times the input vector. But if the error is zero, if the prediction is correct here, zero minus zero is zero, then we can cancel this term and there is no weight update. So let me clear this a little bit here. If both are one, then the error is also zero and then we can also cancel this term. So we can see the weight update only happens if we have an error, if we make a prediction error. And then now let's consider the case where we have a one and a zero here. So then 
the error would be one here. So we would have an error of one. And then we would be adding the weight vector. So if we have um, the case for the predicted label as a zero and the case for the true label a one, this is when we are adding adding something, right? So we are adding the feature vector here. So this is exactly like the case that we have here where y hat is zero and y is one. This is the same case here. Now let me, oh, I can't delete if I switched slides. Okay, so then let me write it like this um, with a different color. So if we have the last scenario zero and one, then our arrow is minus one. And in this case, if this is minus one, we are subtracting, right? So w minus x1. So we are subtracting the feature uh, xi. We are subtracting the feature vector, which is equal to this, um, sorry, to, to this case here, where we are subtracting the input vector. So here, this is really just a mathematical summary of the slide I've shown you before. All right. So. Um, I think if this is confusing, um, maybe look at that more slowly. And then in the next um, video, I will show you vectorization in Python. And um, after that, I will also show you how to implement a perceptron in Python using NumPy and PyTorch, which will, I think, make this video more clear. So what we just have discussed, if this is still complicated, um, I would look at it a little bit more slowly, like uh, step by step, and then maybe don't worry about it too much because we will implement it in code and after that I think it will be really clear.